Welcome to the Barcelona Podcast, episode 178, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. It's Unmissable Opinions, brought to you by the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community. Hi, I'm Dan Hilton, he's Frances Tomas, and before we get started with even an ounce of negativity, I want to congratulate the Barcelona Femini for a resounding 10-1 win over Real Sociedad in the Spanish Super Cup. Utter domination, Frances, and I think it would actually be easier if we talked about the Barcelona Femini today instead of talking about the first team. Hola, Gules. Well, yeah, that would be a really good thing to do. But um, unfortunately, uh, for the girls in particular, I don't think feminine football sells as much as Barca these days. Uh, but that's not to take any credit of the victory. Obviously, you know, there's been a, a long-term project that I think we're in year three or four now at the moment. And things are beginning to, to turn into what we want them to be, which is a winning team. Uh, congratulations to Alexia, Mariona and everyone else. Martins, obviously, and everyone else in the Barca Femini team. 10 to 1 is an absolute demolition. And um, obviously, the haters are going to say that, oh, you know, but Barca, you know, heads and shoulders above everybody else. But that would be people talking about um, basically having no information about Femini has been over the last four or five years and where it is today. So few, huge credit and few congratulations to our girls. Yep. Yeah. Just to wrap up that point, Marta had four goals in the game. Uh, We also had a ton of other goals, two goals from two different players a piece, and then some individuals. That's what got you to 10. But we also see that they were the team that won the Spanish Super Cup last year. So the Barca company going out, taking care of business. And as you mentioned, Frances, about this sporting project, it has been a few seasons since they won the Premier Division. And right now they're in first. They sit atop Atletico Madrid, which is their actual eternal rival in the, the, the Femini universe. So, yeah, just taking care of business in the league. Got the Spanish Super Cup under their belts. You know, a team that made the Champions League final last year. Bringing in Jenny Hermoso was one of the the big signings of the offseason, as well as Caroline Graham Hansen, the winger. And those two have been phenomenal. And just the offensive weapons that this Femini team has uh, is almost unparalleled in their history. So it's not that in the Champions League that you can go and get lucky because obviously there's that looming monster that is Lyon that awaits usually awaits almost anybody in the final for the last few seasons. But Barca Femini, still a lot of work to do. They meet Atletico Madrid at the end of March and beginning of April. So that's a time as they take care of business in the, in the league. Look for that at the end of March and beginning of April because they've got a, another big task up in, a, in the Champions League against their eternal rival. All right, so that is done with the Barcelona Femini. Again, congratulations to them on the Spanish Super Cup. Now let's get into La Ronda today. Frances, we start with a question from Ellie. Do we need a 2008 type of clear out? And he's mentioning how when Pep Guardiola took over, he got rid of Deco, he got rid of Ronaldinho uh, and the like. How can that be achieved with the current crazy market prices and Barca's inability to negotiate a good deal? And also with Barca's lack of funds, because we've wasted so much money over the last three seasons. Um, Do we need a clear out? No, I don't think we need a clear out as in getting rid of our biggest names, because that's what happened at the time. I mean, I know there's been a lot of rumors about this, but Messi hopefully is going nowhere. Um, so, no, the 2008 revolution was just getting rid of your biggest star and one of your regular starters. That would be like getting rid, rid of Messi and the young right now. So, no, no, I don't think we need that. But what is clear is that the status quo in the dressing room needs to change. And basically, we need to have someone driving the boat, which is, I, I hope that it will be still be at the end next year. Someone who has a clear idea as to how Barca should play and someone who the board trusts to make the changes. So if you, if you look at the question from Ellie, it actually says that Guardiola took those decisions. So that's what we need. We need Setien to take the decisions or whoever the board decides to bring in the summer, which, as I said, I hope it is still Setien. But then it will be based on what the idea of the play that the manager wants to develop, then work out which players should stay and which players should go. I mean, it is obvious that we need a, a striker and not necessarily a striker to replace Luis Suarez, but it's a striker to be starting ahead of Luis Suarez while Luis Suarez comes off the bench, or, or vice versa, maybe at the beginning. Um, the way that Valverde plays, we need carrileros, which are left backs, that, left backs and right backs, so full backs, that push all the way forward. Um, we seem to be having um, Firpo play more and more these days. I don't think he's going to be a major success at Barca, regardless of how, tri- how hard Setien tries to put him there. 
Jordi Alba is not getting any younger, so we may need reinforcements on both sides. I mean, Sergio Roberto has played already in four different positions under Setien, and because he's so polyvalent, I would not necessarily class him as a right back. And Semedo is good, but we need someone. If, if, if we're going to play the Setien football that he used to have at Betis, we need someone who's going to be pushing further and going to be sort of excelling at the highest uh, stage, which, you know, Semedo just cannot do um, based on where he is today. I mean, not, not saying he's got no potential, but I think there are some positions that need to change. But most importantly, player power is within the captains. And w- the difference between 2008 and now is that the people that I'm assuming Eli is referring to in these questions, it would be like Piquet, Busquets, etc. They're actually La Masia sort of graduates and, and the Catalans and the Spanish National World Cup champions. So it is a bit different. It's not that they're unprofessional. It's just that the, the end of their careers is coming. And I, I, don't think I don't think there is similarities between 2008 and now, but I certainly do think changes need to be made, but it has to be in accordance to what the manager is wishing and, and seeing for the future of our club. Yeah, I agree with not too much to add, just that when it comes to PK and Busquets and Alba, as you mentioned, I think each of those elder statesman superstars has their own timeline. So it isn't going to be like a 2008. I mean, maybe it is that they're all going to be faded out around the same year, around the same time. But I don't think that has to be the case. I think you're right that of those guys, not only so many of them so important. I mean, Busquets might still have three to four more years to give at Barca. Messi might have three PK has said that he might be retiring early, so maybe he has a year or two. Again, Alba and Luis Suarez are the ones that you maybe want to fade a little bit as Alba loses that pace and loses so much of his game, but he still has such great combination with Messi. So I don't think that 2008 type of clear has to come. Now, if everyone else is still floating around and hanging out in 2022, 2023, I think that changes things a whole lot, but I think we'll cross that bridge when we get there. And as Frances said, the rest of the, the market... Other than that number nine that we have talked about ad nauseum, because I think of that list, Luis Suarez is the first one that has to be relegated to the bench and replaced in that way on the field in the starting lineup. So the rest of the deals that should be done and the things that need to happen have to happen along the margins. And one of those being uh, Emerson was supposed to come in 2021. But I think Barca, who have a really good relationship with Real Betis, should be barking up that tree and see what's there because you saw Emerson against Real Betis. And one of the big important things, not to get too much into that match that happened a few days ago, but I think that because the fullbacks, that being Alex Moreno and Emerson, I thought they outplayed Firpo and, M- and and Nelson Semedo. And in the systems that Real Betis with Ruby still plays and the system that Setien wants to play, if your fullbacks wind, wind up not being as good as the other two fullbacks on the day, it can make life dif- difficult. Yeah, so I, I think that the fullbacks are going to be something, as you fr- said, Frances, I agree, are going to have to be looked at. So, all right, it's time for our betonline.ag listener question of the week. BetOnline.ag is your online sportsbook expert. Use the promo code BLUEWIRE, all one word, for a 50% welcome bonus. Our question of the week is from Armin. Armin, credit to you in the listener group. You've been asking this for a few weeks, and it was such a big idea. I didn't want to get to it, but now we have the two to five minutes to get to it. So Armin asks, is Setien too dogmatic? As that, and speaking for the Johan Cruyff philosophy, is that Cruyffist philosophy outdated in today's footballing world. And Frances, you did get into this a few weeks ago, but I think we're both going to say no, but in the same way, I don't think Setien has had the challenges yet to see whether or not he's too dogmatic. You know, I think in that first year of Inesma Verde, we didn't know that, we thought that he was going to be ch- chaining things up and try- trying different formations, and it was a-, a longer experiment. But then we realized that, oh no, even in the first season, Ernesto Verde has an 11 or 12 players that he likes. That's what he's going to go with, and he's not going to experiment too much. And this is actually what Valverde football is. And Setien, he went with that 3 5 2. He tried to implement a radical change right at the start, but it seems like since he's moved back to a 4 3 3, he seems to just be kind of trying to build on what Valverde did for now. And I'm interested to see what happens if he is, as you said, given a next year, given another opportunity, because we know he does want to attempt to play a 3 5 2, particularly, and maybe with different personnel. And as you mentioned as well, if he has the opportunity to bring in some of the players that he wants to bring in over the summer, we'll see how he institutes that system. But it's all about, I think, I don't think he can be dogmatic when you have a board that's maybe purchasing players that he necessarily doesn't want or fit in his system. Yeah, well, totally agreed. I mean, Setien has played seven matches or has been in charge for seven matches and has used different tactics already. As you said, the 3-5-2 in the first three games, 
became, especially in the first two games, just just too boring. Too, it didn't have any sort of dynamism, or it, the, the team wasn't incisive and basically was going nowhere. So he decided to shift to what the players were saying, which was a four-three-three. Um, the the injuries to Dembele and Suarez obviously haven't helped him either. But I think that Barca is getting closer and closer to being a team that can challenge for titles now. Um, the last game, uh, the 4-3-3, in my eyes, evolved to a 4-4-2, actually, because you had Griezmann and Messi up front. Well, Messi was whatever he wanted, as, as usual. But I think Sergio Roberto and the Young especially, they weren't wingers. They were midfielders in a sort of rumbus formation that could pop forward. I mean, the, the goal that the Young scored is a pl- clear example of what the Dutchman can actually add to the team. And I think that's that's a great position for him to have. Um, obviously, the addition of Arturo Vidal there as, as the more advanced midfielder actually unbalances things quite a lot as well because, you know, he's unpredictable as well. Uh, but the thing is, he understands Messi's runs and Messi's movements and he's one of the best associates that Messi actually does have. And if you are going to start an important game, which the game at Betis and Sevilla was crucial, um, you start the game with Firpo, then you're playing arguably with one less player, uh, especially in attack. And the moment that Jordi Alba starts or, or sort of comes onto the game, then Messi's got another associate that understands exactly what he's thinking and a constant reference that opens the pitch wider, then, then the whole sort of rumbus and scheme does change. Um, as to whether he can be successful, yeah, of course he can. But I think he needs to, to make the plantilla, to make the squad according to his requirements. Um, and I don't think he's got enough time to do it now. So he's just doing the best with the tools he has, which... And, and, you know, we have been negative for a while in the podcast, basically, thanks to Valverde and his dead, boring football and, and the tools that the board have given him over the years, basically devaluing the squad to, to do that with, um, not planning well enough for the departures. For example, in the winter transfer window, three departures, no arrivals whatsoever. I mean, that's going to affect any team. Levante, Leganes, Getafe will be suffering with that. And Barca challenging in three competitions, obviously, We've lost La Copa already, so it's only two now, but it's the biggest two, let's be optimistic. Then it's a difficult job to do. So I really, you know, have got full admiration for what the is trying to build. And I wish I wish him all the best. Um, as to what his clear idea of football is, we will have to see next season when he's got enough time to plan out, speak to the obviously we'll have to still be the current board because we cannot board them out this summer but see what, what tools he's given and how much time he's given and, and free them to make Barca what he wants it to be, which is Cruyff philosophy, attacking football being based on his tactics and, and what he believes. Yep, so there you have it, the betonline.ag listener question of the week. Remember to use promo code BLUEWIRE, all one word, for your 50% welcome bonus at betonline.ag. Charlie Barca asked, if no one is going to shoot, what's the point in having a striker? And Guatham added to that, why pass to Messi when they are in the better position? And he and both these guys are asking why it seems like there is an over-reliance on Messi. We've talked about Messi de Venencia for years now, and I don't know if it was fully on display against Real Betis. I don't know if, actually know if we've, I don't think we've seen too much of it uh, recently. I mean, you look at the game against Real Betis where Messi probably should have had his own goal, uh, as was the case against Athletic Club, where he wasn't finishing, neither did Griezmann. But I think in the Setien system, one of the things, as you mentioned, we've been negative, but I've been hopeful about the different guys that have had opportunities and the different opportunities to shoot and the shots that have been available to Barca and the finishing since Setien showed up has has not been at a premium. But again, there's only three natural forwards in the team at all. And Ansu Fadi is a 17-year-old who has a brace under Kike Setien. So there's not much to complain about there. And the other point I, I would make in saying this is, yes, it's it's not good to have a Luis Suarez who's going to finish those shots that, 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 we're, that we're having. But I thought, to your point about Arturo Vidal earlier against Real Petis, you understand the idea because it really was actually more of a 4-3 one two where it was Vidal sitting in behind Griezmann and Messi and the issue that comes with Vidal in Setien's system is that Vidal gets exposed particularly in these when he starts a match when his first touch is not there and I don't think Griezmann or Vidal especially in the first half of the game against Real Betis their first touch was not really 
too great. And that second goal by Fakir, Umtiti could have stepped up quicker and been in a position to not allow the shot, sure. But that all comes because Vidal lost the ball in the position in the way that he did, where he was coming back to his own goal and his first touch let him down. And so Vidal, I, I think, unfortunately for Vidal, both in a good and a bad way, he gets exposed by the player that he is in the Setien system. But as you mentioned, Frances, it is almost essential that he starts that kind of match because of his physicality, A, but B, his connection to Messi, and also C, his ability to score goals, as we saw even under Valverde, he is still the midfielder with the most goals. So it's a bright sign to see De Jong and Busquets get on the score sheet, but that was only their second of the season, and they are not natural goal-scoring midfielders. And the same thing with Artur, he might have had that Galazzo earlier in the year, but he doesn't really look to shoot. And as I've been critical on the Patreon quick take match review, unfortunately for Rakitic, he used to have a cannon from outside the box. And it used to be that long shot was a threat, but he has not hit the he has not hit water falling out of a boat in terms of getting up to shoot around the the eighteen yard box for quite a few weeks. I, I mean, every time he lets one go, I go, okay, that is the the every match Rakitic is going to let one fly from eighteen to twenty five yards, and it's just going to go way over. So that's just the midfielders we have at the moment, not really scoring goals in the way that a lot of them are built to score. So it's going to almost be a change in their game. And so again, I'm very happy to see that Busquets and De Young were able to get on the score sheet, as did Lang Lei for his second goal of the season. So I don't know, actually, Charlie and Gwatham, not to disagree with your question, but Frances can probably answer more about the hesitation that players have about when they're passing to Messi and why they choose not to shoot the ball. But the other thing I would also attribute it to my final point is that Messi always has two or three guys around him, sure, but they're bracing for that. And I think the that's the difficulty with Firpo, I think, in that match. I, I know you've been critical of him, but defensively, I thought he was solid in the game. It was just offensively, as any fullback that isn't Jordi Alba or Danny Alves has had in the Messi era, is that, you know, you're looking for that cross. That's the idea. You have to get it into Messi. But it takes time and chemistry and work. Really, it takes a lot of reps to be able to pinpoint that pass into Messi, who always has two or three guys around him. It's just a challenging pass to make because of the attention that Messi has. Yep. Um, you've exhausted a lot of my points. So I'm just going to add the ones that I don't think you've mentioned. So uh, Messi dependence is natural because he's the best player in the world and he's saved the boat for so many years. Um, and all the players know that when everything gets, when everything seems lost, and when everything gets to be sort of sank, then Messi appears. And and uh, in the final third, if you're not sure about what which pass to to, to take, uh, what space to go for, then if you give it to Messi, he could just turn it into a um, into a golazo in the top corner in the por la squadra. So that's probably what the players are thinking, and that's why the dependence is going there. Um, having said that, that's sort of the general point. Lately, in the last two three matches, Messi hasn't actually been that good in front of goal. But I'm not worried because obviously it's messy and, and everything will come back. And to be honest, he, if he's saving the, the goals for the end of the season, that's going to be even better for us. But um, because that's been the case, Messi's been in his best sort of version of the, being the assister. Because obviously Busquets, the Young and Leglet score against Betis. That's sort of three non-regular scorers. But it's three assists from Messi. So he's still influencing every single goal, which is why I said that Messi is the system. You can make it 3-5-2, you can make it 27-2-7, you know, it doesn't matter how many players. If Messi is in your team, he's going to be the center to, to everything and he's going to be the definitive answer. Um, where does this sequia from Messi come, this, this goal drought from Messi? Well, it may be the, the fact that there isn't a reference up there. So basically the absence of Suarez, because Suarez will always be sort of arguing, fighting, I'm not going to say bite in because that would be the, the easy joke out of the way. But, you know, one defender will have to occupy himself with Suarez. And because of his mobility and, and the fact that you basically can get around him, that normally attracts yet another defender. Now, those two are, are, are freer now because obviously Griezmann's form has been up and down. The guy, you know, works hard, but he's not Suarez. He's not that deadly in front of goal. And he doesn't need that much taken care of. So, so those people are able to pop out of the defence, the centre-backs I'm talking about, are able to pop out of the defence and to sort of block what Messi normally does, which is um, run around between the lines. And if he can break one of the, say, defensive midfielders or the, the, you know, the side midfielders, doesn't quite matter which one, he normally drifts towards the middle and then he's got space. But when he does that now, there's a centre-back that is freer because of the Suarez non-reference. So that's, that's, that's been a little bit harder. But 
I am overall not worried. Um, I think that the fact that goals are coming from midfield and even sort of set pieces or you know defenders popping up that's that's really good because it would be it would make Barca much more predictable and would give Messi more spaces to be the influential self that he always is. He just needs to put his shooting boots back on. Uh, but then we all know the quality of those boots. So let's let's hope that that is soon. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's take a quick break and we'll be back to talk more in La Ronda. Ever seen Untucked Button Down? They look bad. Why? Because they weren't meant to be worn that way. Thankfully, there's Untuck It, the original button-down shirt actually designed to be worn untucked. No matter your size or shape, Untuck It shirts always fall at the perfect untucked length. And you've heard me say it before, Ricky Pouge, I think, may be able to use an Untuck It jersey. Uh, I know that Barcelona may not necessarily make those specifically yet, but he's certainly a guy that I'd like to see with some Untuck It shirts every now and again because he has that thing hiked up almost to his neck, and he, it does look a little bit younger than the exceptional, exceptional talent that Ricky Pouge is. So whether you're shopping for the perfect gift or just trying to craft a smart, relaxed style of your own, Untuck It is the way to go. Visit untuckit.com and use the code BLUE for 20% off at checkout. That's U-N-T-U-C-K-I-T dot com and promo code BLUE for 20% off. All right, back from the break, we got a question from Christopher. Why has Mark andre Ter Stegen's ball distribution become so sloppy? And Christopher, not that I'm going to disagree a little bit, but I looked at the stats on this, and actually Ter Stegen's passing is up in the Kike Setien era, percentage-wise even. So I don't know if it is particularly getting sloppier. Uh, he went from an 85.8 percentage to all the way up now to 87.8% in the Liga, and it was even lower in the Champions League under Ernesto Valverde. But why it looks like it's sloppier, and I was, again, looking at the Real Batiste match in this, and against even Athletic Club, it quote-unquote looks sloppy, but that's because he's taking much more risk. That, that's just the, the, the plain heat thing here, where he, under Kike Setien, whenever you've seen him in his Las Palmas days or Real Batiste, the goalkeepers, and you see this a lot in, in modern, the modern goalkeeper, they're expected, the Neuers of the world, who I know we've been fighting about Neuer and Ter Stegen, but Neuer backed in form with Bayern Munich. I got a chance to see them two weeks ago, and he is almost back to his best. And what that means is he's taking risks as well. And Ter Stegen is the same thing. Being ambidextrous the way that Ter Stegen is, being able to hit a pass with both feet is an asset that I really like that Kike Setien is trying to utilize. I trust Ter Stegen with the ball. Honest, honestly, his first touch, I trust more than Arturo Vidal's, which is crazy to say, but um, <laughs> but but I do. I think That's not crazy at all. That's yeah. the right thing to do. <laughs> right. And so I think Ter Stegen's ball distribution, is, I think it's necessary, it's important. And you even saw... The one that resulted in the De Young goal, remember that starts with an Umtiti back pass to Ter Stegen, who finds Langley, who hits... I, I've been on Langley and very critical of his ball playing as well this season, uh, or overall, I just don't know if he has that pass in him. But the ball, if it was on purpose that he got into De Young as De Young made his dribbling run that eventually ended his goal off Messi, that pass from Langley was one of the highlights of the match. And again, if that's on purpose, that is sensational play by by Langley, but that all happens because Ter Stegen is able to bring two different Real Betis players towards him and give Langley the room to hit that pass. And so Ter Stegen's ball distribution out of the back, still phenomenal. And I think when you take those kind of risks, there are going to be some mistakes made. And that is what Barca is just going to have to live with. It's difficult. I think it doesn't say more about Ter Stegen's ball distribution than it does about the defense, that our defense, as Frances has mentioned, they're in a way right now. I've yelled and yelled and yelled about Tadebo, but you look at what's going to happen against Hadafe. It seems that PK is fit and going to be getting one of the starting spots, but Langley is suspended and Umtiti looks a little injured, so he may not be able to feature. So that means what you're going to bring up another right footed center back in Ronald Araujo. And if what if PK isn't good to go, then what are you going to do? You're going to bring, you're going to have to do Araujo from the B team. And it's, a, it, I mean, Sergio Busquets is the name we always say, but uh, does yeah. Kike Setien want to take him out of the midfield? So I think the big thing has just been the center back pairings and how the center backs have kind of been in flux as they do with injuries and suspensions and all those different things. So I, I don't think Ter Stegen should be the focus here. No, no, I don't think so. But, um, you, again, you've answered the question. Uh, I'm just going to add that it is a directive from the manager to play from the back, whether it's risky or not. Because once you are attracting a line of defense from the from the rivals, and you know the line of defense is actually the forward line, um, once you can beat them, normally by passing to the side and breaking through with a long pass. But then again, your 
typical Sergio Roberto run when he beats one defender and just conducts the ball with him, that is breaking the first line. So that's going to generate the fact that it's only likely to be two more lines to break so instead of three. So that's going to, to, to unbalance things. Normally, you sort of push the game towards one side and you shift quickly with a long pass towards the other or a through pass or a run or anything like that. And that is, um, that's a non-negotiable. That's something that Setien wants, whether it's risky or not, because it generates advantages further down the line. Yeah, I, I think that's, again, that wraps that one up. So we've got a double question from Ira and Daniel. Ira asks, how has VAR been a problem? Or I, really, the question here is, is VAR a problem to you, Frances? And related to that, Daniel says, why, besides some bad luck, are the refs losing control of our matches so often? And these things are kind of related, where with VAR, and I think this is all inspired by the fact that Mark Bartra was basically bringing down Messi in the box late in that match. Maybe a penalty happens, so maybe Barca winds up putting them away 4-2 instead of hanging on to 3-2. So that should have been... I, there was a, a question for VAR, but because nothing happened, there was, no, was, there was no finalization of that. It seemed like VAR didn't step in to let the ref know that that was a penalty on Mark Bartra. And then to Daniel's point, it's all connected because the refs for the VAR ability they have seem to be losing control of the match. And this has to do with the yellows that are being brought out. It seems that just happened against Athletic Club and Real Batiste. But, you know, to Daniel's question, that might just be the fever of how important these matches are for these sides. Yeah, and also... There's, there's two answers to this question. There's the political correct answer, which is VAR is a system that is for refereeing that has been introduced this year. And because it's been introduced all recently, the year before, I think it was, but because it's a recent development, then it's still being trialed and tricked and tested and, you know, everything throughout the course of a season evens up. That's the political answer. The, the answer that I want to give is the fact that Madrid haven't won a league for quite a while. Uh, Barca have won eight leagues, La Ligas, out of the last 11. And that hurts, um, <laughs> particular people in the capital of Spain. And because that's the case, then, you know, if things get sort of down to the wire, which is very likely that they will, especially because Madrid are ahead of us at this moment with a classical coming up in two, three weeks, then, you know, if, if things continue to go to the very end, then it is likely that some decisions may not come Barca's way. Uh, because, <laughs> you know, for the product, it is great that Madrid actually wins this Liga because, you know, it would even think up more. No one in the capital of Spain, and, and I don't want to say the vast majority of Spain, because Barca have changed the landscape of the fans' base's second team. So, so say, for example, you're from, from Bilbao, so you support Athletic and another team. If you are from Gijón, you will support Gijón and another team. And basically, any, everyone in Spain, regardless of what, where they're born and what team is their first, they always have either Barcelona or Madrid as second, or they, they prefer one or the other. So what I'm trying to say is that for the product of La Liga, it is good that Madrid wins this one. Um, so whether that is... In, am I saying the whole system is rigged? No. But when it comes to those decisions in those final two, three matches, then we're probably going to have to watch this pace. And... The last thing I would say, which which could be related, but it's sort of refereeing, not conspiracy, but refereeing fact, is that Barca have the worst record in terms of yellow cards and sending offs since the 2003-2004 season. So that's 17 years ago that Barca don't have this many um, amonestaciones, this many bookings, and definitely not this many sending offs. So there's a fact for you. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'm not going to put on my conspiracy helmet. The one thing I will say about Girona, too, I think Girona, they're supposed to be rooting for Manchester City, right? That's what they were told to do with uh, when Man City came in about Girona. But, uh, you That's know, where the money comes from, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Frances, I'm, I'm not going to put on my conspiracy helmet just yet, as you are, because, I mean, you know, I think even like Jose Martinez, who was the referee against Real Batiste, I thought he, things like, got away from him, and he had a bad match officiating but I think he's generally been good to that point but the one thing I will circle here and this is not really cause and effect it's almost a chicken or the egg thing where the defense has not been as good as it was in recent seasons and that is the beginning of this season with Valverde so it's not just enough of Valverde Kike set to change thing this is all season long the defense has been far less or uh, much in, much inferior to what it was in recent seasons and that is telling because of the number of bookings you mentioned to Gerard BK he has what three or four times as many as he had all 
all of last season already where Mm -hmm. he's getting those suspensions. So that tells you that he's being put in more compromising positions more often. But to that point, are all of those actually yellows? That's hard to tell. And as far as the conspiracies that you speak about as well between Real and Barcelona, there certainly is an idea that since the game has gotten more, not only more global, but because there are so many cameras and because everything is ruffled through like a fine tooth comb, unlike it was in the 50s and 60s, because you can go back in the 60s and look at some of those matches with with Real Madrid and you go, well, I mean, there's not much footage out there, but it also, even in those Champions League uh, victories, it go, you, you kind of have to tilt your head a little bit and go, I'm not so sure about some of that stuff. And I think there's a case to be made in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, all that stuff. But with, a high def- with the high-powered cameras that we have, the other point, this is not in support of VAR or in defense of VAR, but at the Women's World Cup when they were first instituting VAR, and I think even in the Premier League, there are way more mistakes than in Spain. I think actually VAR has done a better job in Spain than it has in the Premier League or uh, it's particularly in the Women's World Cup where it, it was not so great. So they, I think, are still getting through and working through all the different issues. But to not to agree with you too much, Frances, but yeah, I think if things go 50-50, it's going to be easy for whether you're Los Blancos or Barcelona, there's going to come moments at the end of the season where one of these fan bases is going to have the right to say they're against us. And I think it's going to be hard to argue those things, but whether or not there's any truth to it, only uh, those in the legal offices will ever know. So to talk more about the results and things about Barcelona, again, we're going to have a question from Cole. What is more responsible for the lacking results at the club this season and last? Is it on-field talent, understanding, performance, or off-pitch mentality, determination, or motivation? So do you think it has to do with on-field stuff, more or off-pitch stuff? And it's both, obviously, Frances, but I think Cole's kind of asking which way would you lean if you just had to pick one. So who's to blame for Barca not being incredible? Is well, is it, is it is it on-field stuff or is it? do you think there's a lot of stuff going off-pitch as far as mentality? Oh, it's or... a combination. In short, I think the board has sabotaged the squad um, in terms of personnel. But most important, leaving Valverde after knowing that his credit had fully run out after Liverpool um, and everything else so is it's a result of that. I mean, if they had brought a new coach with new ideas, then he would have obviously seen what was in front of him and he would have taken taken decisions to, to make things better. I think this, you know, we have to go past the, oh, it's because Messi is not scoring goals. Oh, it's because Busquets, no, say, say, it's because Arturo Vidal couldn't control the ball. It's beyond that, you know, and it's, it's also beyond... Oh, it's because the manager is this, the manager is that. I mean, ultimately, the one person who calls every decision, or is not necessarily calls, but is in charge of every decision, is Jose Maria Bartomeu. And I don't think he's done the job that he needs to do. I mean, he, the, the, the club has been far away from the philosophy that made the club great um, and gave us the most success for the last three, four years. And, and that's unacceptable. And... You know, the signings that he, because of the philosophy and because of the, basically his lack of knowledge of football. I mean, he's a businessman. He's not a footballer. He was never a player. And he doesn't surround himself with players that really understand what Barca is about. Because, you know, with all due respect to Avidal, he's not a La Masia graduate. He, was, he wasn't raised throughout the La Masia system. And, of course, he played under Guardiola and he was fantastic for us. Though, don't get me wrong, but... I think there's a lot of players before Avidal that, that should be advising him. The thing is, the the, the, the greats of the past, so your Iniestas, Chavis, etc., don't want to go anywhere near him because they don't trust him. So it's on the board. Yeah, so uh, to translate your answer, Cole, uh, Frances has gone with off pitch. And I could definitely, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, <laughs> that's and, what I should have said. That would have been a one word answer. Sorry for saying too much. No, no, no. Perfectly <laughs> answering the question. And I, and I, Cool. I, I mean, I don't have much to add to Francesca's point that I, I agree with that. I mean, on-field talent, Lino Messi exists on the field for Barcelona. So, and bringing in the likes of Antoine Griezmann, as I mentioned, how much I, how excited I was for Frankie de Jong, and Busquets is still floating around. So, you know, as much as we're critical of some of the performances this season, and certain players have had bad performances at the most inopportune times, yeah, you could see that off-pitch mentality, and of all the important games that Barca have lost, mentality and 
I don't even think it's motivation. I just think there's been that block that we've spoken about ad nauseum here on the show, and the players have had to answer those questions for the last two years now since that night at Roma, and it just continued. So a mentality, I think, has a lot to do with it. And all the different things that they say, whether it's a row between the French players and the other players, or whether it was an issue between Ter Stegen, who didn't support Valverde, and Messi, who did, and a row at practice, and all those different things, I wouldn't read too much into the tabloids ever. Because as we've talked about, even the Catalan media that you can trust and their coverage of Usmani Dembele, I always side-eye that a little bit as well. And I think things are always taken as far as selling papers and an extra little story, an extra little nugget where if it's only a 10-word story and your editor asks for 200 to 400 to 500 words so we can publish it, well, there's got to be something else added. So there maybe isn't necessarily something that should be uh, said to be true. But certainly there are things going on off the pitch that need to be rectified so Barca can get totally right on the field. Okay, so we got an easy one, Frances, from Tintin. Not a new thing, but do you think there will come a time when players will get cards for pretending to be injured. And, you know, I think that's something that the they don't want to take more time away and time waste as far as people's time, as far as the spectator's time. They don't want to have to have referees having to be checking this and going over. Let's say they have to do VAR to see if somebody was pretending, but they are certainly trying to get players for simulation where you saw De Young recently get a yellow for what was deemed as simulation. I think that that as cameras and VAR get improved, this is certainly something, Tintin, that we could see where pretending to be injured could come back to bite players. But more likely, it's going to come in fines as they do now even. It's going to be fines after the fact. So the point to hear is to really slap players on the wrist is to make that fine so egregious where it does change the way that they're playing. And that is a difficult thing to do because that is a lot of money for some of these footballers. Exactly. I don't really see that changing too much <laughs> because otherwise you're turning the game into, say, football sala, which is five-a-side football, when you've got 20 to 25 minutes, depending on what competition it is, of actual playing time, uh, like sort of the NBA do. But that would be changing the sport a bit too much, so I don't really see that changing. Yep, I think that's where we can leave that one. Douglas asks, I know I asked about Arthur last week, but I have to ask again, where does he fit in the Setian system? With Puj, Alenia, De Young, and the potential of Pedri, is it time to move on? Uh, and Douglas, my quick response to that is, Puj still has work to do to break in. Alenia is currently out on loan, and Pedri is still just 17 years old and playing in the second division at Las Palmas. So timeline-wise, Arthur has plenty of time still in his early 20s to get assimilated. And as I've said, I don't think we've seen Setien's full vision, and I think for the full vision that Setien has, which has to do a lot with possession, it has to do with ball retention, it has to do with uh, through balls, those are all things that Artur does at an exceptional rate, and he's world-class at at least those three skills, and I think those all fit in Setien's vision. So I do think Artur is going to fit in. Where he fits in at the moment between Vidal and Busquets and De Jong and Rakitic and who's starting what, there aren't many players, and Puj is trying to break in, but Setien does not have that many players at his disposal. So for the rest of this season, I counted it out. If Barca were to win the Champions League, and, well, La Liga doesn't matter. Those matches are already on the schedule. But if they were to win everything this season, you're talking 22 more matches. So there is going to be a ton of rotation. And as Artur, as I believe, continues to get healthy and continues to reassimilate himself after his, after his layoff and injuries and all those different things off the field, I think he's just going to continue to excel, continue to get better, and get his, most importantly, get his match fitness, which is, I think, the most important thing to help him fit into Setien system. A guy that doesn't really seem to do the best that he can off the field as far as his body, if he can get some of that stuff sorted out, I think that's going to be the biggest thing to help him fit into Setien's system. Exactly. He just needs to put his head in the right place, avoid injuries. He's obviously young, um, and he's more than a valid player to be a squad player at Barca. Whether he could break the starting eleven depends on how well he does the three things that I just mentioned. Yep. So, Frances, I'll have you wrap this one up with a question from Eric. How do you think Setien has fared so, so far? Very well, to be honest. Uh, much better than I would have done and much better than Valverde would have done at this stage. I mean, Valverde may have had some more points in his casillero, in the classification, in the stands, but um, we still will be going nowhere. So I think he's done really well. I mean, uh, as a leader, as a manager, you come in with an idea, but the guy has very quickly realized that what he wanted to implement just couldn't happen because of the tools at his disposal, and most importantly, the timeline. I mean, getting the team in mid-January, that's not 
that's not something that a manager wants. But, you know, his dream was to coach Barca, so the opportunity came, so he took it. And I'm grateful for that. Three matches it took him to change the scheme to what the players sort of wanted. But he had already been working on changing not necessarily every mechanism, but the speed, the risk-taking, the, the decisiveness, the one-touch football, the looking into spaces, the association, the dynamism, all of that is better. Um, also, and then obviously he went for a 4-3-3 and then three matches later he said, all right, let's adjust this. And he went for the 4-4-2 with the rumbus in the middle that I explained at the beginning of the podcast um, that Dan calls 4-3-1-2. It's the same thing. So I think that he's shown that he's flexible. He's shown that he is his love for football in terms of passing attacking football is non-negotiable. He has installed a, a, a confidence in the player that the players that was great to see. I mean, Barca hadn't won an away game since December, and uh, the game at, at Betis, I think they had they had the ball and the control of the match for the vast majority of it. I think that they face adversity once again. I mean, Barca have conceded first 12 times this year. And out of those, they've only won four. Um, so that's not to be... No, they've won five. Won five and lost four and drawn the other three or two, which if my maths don't escape me. So it is quite significant to see that away from home, they conceded first, they were resilient enough to come back. And there were some terrible performances, especially uh, from Firpo and Umtiti. I think they were both terrible. But despite that, they fought together. Um, it was good to see. I don't know if it, the, the listeners have seen it. There was an arenga, like a conversation from Messi to the team, in which he finally was captured by the cameras for being the captain. He was sort of going towards togetherness, towards unity, towards um, it's going to come. Let's be, let's be resilient. Let's be confident. Let's trust ourselves. And all of that was non-existent or, or just impossible to be seen during the Valverde years. And definitely these last three, four months that he had. So without a doubt, I think he's doing an excellent job. I know that he's going to face a lot of criticism. But then again, so did Cruyff and Guardiola when they were coaching. So what's Setien going to get? And I just just very exciting to see what comes. Um, obviously, Madrid are much more solid in La Liga than they've been in previous years. So we may or may not win that. Um, Liverpool and I would say Manchester City and some other teams of European level are very dangerous. Um, PSG obviously up front, they've got a lot, so we may not win the Champions League either, but I don't think we've, we can be counted out for any of the two big competitions. And that's more than I could say a month ago when Valverde was captain of the ship. So very satisfied with Setien so far. Yeah, Francesca, I think it's a good place to leave it with a little bit of positivity. We've been negative in recent weeks, but thank you so much to these listener questions. We had a lot of I think really good ones. We had a lot of meandering ones and you get that over the transfer market, and the transfer window. These are a lot of really good questions. And I thought, Frances, you were bringing the stats today. You're bringing the energy, you're bringing the positivity. So I think that's a pretty good piece, place to leave it. Yep. Let's leave it there. All right. So thanks again so much to the listeners who provided questions and apologies even to the ones that we didn't get to. As our mean showed you with our listener question of the week, if you do keep asking questions, some of them don't necessarily apply to just today. They apply to big ideas and uh, over the course of a season. So if you keep asking those questions as they're more relevant, we'll certainly get to those. So thanks so much for giving those questions from our closed Facebook group, as well as you, the listeners, for again tuning in, tapping your app and check out the show notes to subscribe. You can also find us on social media too. We're on Twitter at the Barcelona pod or at hilton d13 for me and on instagram at the barcelona pod that closed facebook group is tbpod.link backslash group deeper dives and discussions you can also help us out on patreon to continue making these shows and hear our quick take match reviews tbpod.link backslash patreon we're also on youtube now at the barcelona podcast and that is not just now but i come out with a special video every week unrelated to to the podcast and not just rehashing some old stuff we do some new stuff over there as well usually list history and the like so check us out there hit that subscription button that's a big help give us a like all that stuff and thanks so much for listening most importantly to the barcelona podcast until next time we'll talk to you soon and force the bar set forza